Okay, really quickly, before we get into the best of 2023, I just wanted to say thank you. We launched this channel on November 3rd, 2023, and ever since we dropped our first video, the support has been overwhelming. So I just wanted to say thank you guys so much. 2023 has been an amazing year, and I am so excited to see what 2024 has in store for us. I know it's gonna be amazing. Trust me, bro. Now let's get into the video. How would you like to be tortured? Chances are you don't wanna to be tortured. But just in case you did, I put together a list of the 10 most brutal torture methods ever used in human history. These are ranked from least worst to worst worst, in my opinion. Let's get right into it. 10. The Breaking Wheel Okay, so starting off strong. The Breaking Wheel might sound like a fun toy, but I can guarantee you it's nothing of the sort. Originating in ancient Greece with the sole purpose of being a torture device, the Breaking Wheel, also known as the Catherine Wheel, or simply put, the wheel, was a form of public execution. The torture method was pretty simple. It was literally just a big wooden wagon wheel. There was plenty of ways this rather simple device could be used, but the most common uses of the wheel was in the Middle Ages and consisted of having the victim tied up by their hands and feet to the wheel and then having all of their limbs broken on the wheel. Once they were beaten almost fully to death, they would then be hoisted up on a stake and left to die, which would usually happen shortly after. Other less common but kind of fun ways that the wheel were used was having the victim tied on the outside of the wheel and then rolling them down a hill, which is kind of hilarious in a morbid way. Or less hilarious, having them swung over an open flame, giving them consistent burn exposure until the wheel caught on fire, burning the victim alive. Definitely not fun, but nowhere near as bad as what's to come. 9. The Spanish Tickler Okay, so basically Freddy Krueger claws or Wolverine hands. Just imagine those Hulk hand toys like you had when you were a kid, but instead of being like a soft glove, it's actually a metal torture device. The device itself was a long, sharp set of claws held in the torturer's hand and was used on the victim in a slow and methodical manner. The victim would be tickled across their entire bodies, sometimes down to bone, and if they didn't bleed to death on the spot, the infection that would soon appear would definitely finish them off. There's not a ton more to say about these flesh ripping devices, besides the fact that they are debated on whether or not the Spanish Tickler was actually used as a torture device. Although brutal, the Spanish Tickler is still relatively tame compared to some of the other methods on this list, which is why it's only in the number 9 spot. 8. Bamboo Torture Just from hearing the name alone, where did your mind go? Did you think of people being beaten by bamboo poles? Sharp pieces of bamboo being stuck under people's nails? Maybe being stabbed with bamboo rods? Nope. Bamboo torture consists of being tied up and having planted bamboo shoots grow from the ground through your body because of how fast bamboo grows. Initially, victims would be tied up and sat over top of a bamboo plant while it was still in the ground right before it would sprout, and the plant itself would grow up through the victim's anus through the victim's body. Now, they had to change this method because initially, a lot of victims liked it. I'm kidding. I'm not sure if anyone actually enjoyed it, but I'm sure there's at least one person that as soon as the bamboo started to make their way up there, they were like, huh. In most common practice, the victim was secured over multiple bamboo plants still in the ground right before they were going to sprout, placed in such a way where they were going to puncture vital organs, such as the heart and the lungs. Bamboo grows extremely fast and can grow up to 36 inches within 24 hours, meaning that a lot of the victims of this torture were dead within a day. I think the worst part of this torture method would just be the fact that you can feel the bamboo slowly moving through your body, slowly killing you. And it's really just a fight between you and nature, a slow moving fight that you won't win. 7. Blood Eagle Okay, this one's brutal. You've been warned. The Blood Eagle was an ancient Viking torture method, and the Blood Eagle's goal was to rip the victim's ribs and lungs from their back to create almost a winged look. They would start by having the victim tied up and laid on their stomach on the ground. Once the victim was on the ground, a specific viking with a large, sharp knife or axe would begin cutting open their back with so much force that it would actually break their ribs. The ribs would then be pulled and stretched outward like wings. The worst part is when they rip the victim's lungs out and stretch them over top of the ribs to create the complete wing look. By the time the lungs were removed, the victim was dead and covered in blood, and typically the body would then be hoisted on a stake to be displayed. Vikings were savages. 6. Filleting Alive this method is a bit straightforward, but still worth going over. The filleting alive torture method was used all around the world, but for this brief example, we're going to be focusing on the practice within medieval Europe. For a victim to be first properly filleted, they must be softened up. 
which typically consisted of leaving the victim out in the sun to get sunburns all over their body to promote inflammation of the skin or the victim would simply be boiled alive. The entire purpose of the softening up process was so that the torturer could make precise incisions into the victim's body, allowing them to keep the victim alive for as long as possible. The filleting process itself would start with a long cut down the victim's thigh. But even in more rare and twisted situations, the torturer would start by cutting the face off the victim, which is the most painful part due to the amount of nerves on the face that allow for facial expression. Once the long cuts were made across the body, the worst of it began. Once the cuts were made, the knives were put away and the torturers began to pull and tear the skin off the body by hand, ripping the skin from the nerves and the muscle that lie underneath. This process would continue until the victim was truly naked. The absolute worst part is that this wouldn't kill you. If your torturer was precise and skilled enough, you could live for days after this operation. So how did this torture method end up killing the victim? Great question. The three most common causes of death, from most common to least common, were blood loss, infection, and hypothermia due to not having any skin to thermoregulate the body. Not fun, kids. Keep your skin on. 5. Chinese Water Torture Chinese Water Torture is probably one of the most well-known torture methods on this entire list. It was featured in a Mythbusters episode and a few other places as well. Chinese water torture begins with having the victim lie on their back with their hands, feet, and head completely secured so that they cannot move. The victim is either in a dark room or completely blindfolded to cause sensory deprivation. Just above the victim's forehead is a bucket of icy water with a small hole in the bottom, just large enough to let water pass through, but just small enough so that the water falls at irregular intervals. This torture method may seem simple, but it is truly compounding and exponential in nature, meaning that it gets worse as time goes on. Most people, when they mention this torture method, only focus on the psychological damage which comes from it, which is severe and often cases causes loss of sanity or consciousness. But in this brief example, I want to focus on the physical aspect as well, too. It doesn't take long for the water to begin eroding the skin, slowly penetrating with each drop. A blister forms on the skin and slowly grows with each additional drip. The skin becomes raw and the water droplets become excruciating in nature. The physical pain matched with the severe mental damage makes this torture method one of the worst, in my opinion. But we still have four more to go. Four. Cock and ball torture. Okay, this isn't actually number four. I just wanted to lighten the mood because this video was getting dark. Okay, back to work. Four. White room torture. White room torture is the only strictly psychological torture method on this list. But don't let the lack of physical pain fool you. This method is brutal. White room torture has been used much more in modern times by governments as a way to break an individual, typically to extract information. With one bright white light always on, in white clothes, served only white food, left with nothing but their own thoughts. No color, no noise, no stimulation of any sort. Just nothingness and your own thoughts. This extreme sensory deprivation would cause severe mental damage in only a few days' time. Some of the early symptoms include depression, anxiety, hallucinations, and even loss of consciousness. It's hard to fully grasp the full extent of the mental torment that you would experience in such a situation, but the victims who have experienced it firsthand and those who have been in prisons with white rooms have all said that those who go in are never the same if they make it out. You might be thinking, if they make it out, of course they'll make it out. Well, if insanity didn't set in and completely take over their mind, a lot of victims would attempt to take their own life to simply end the torture. 3. Swedish Drink Swedish Drink, oh boy. This is probably one of the grossest torture methods on the list. This one's pretty simple, so I'll start with a bit of context. Swedish Drink was brought about during the Thirty Year War from 1618 to 1648 in Europe and was used by Swedish mercenaries, typically on German villagers, during raids as a torture method to get civilians to talk and give the locations of the village's valuables. So what was the drink? Simply put, it's a crude mixture of human or animal feces and urine put together in a bucket. A true poop smoothie, if you will. Victims of this torture method would be held down and force-fed this awful concoction. The traumatic experience alone of being fed this horrible drink was bad enough, but it did not end there. If the mercenaries were extra evil, they would wait until the victim's stomachs would become bloated from the mixture, and then they would begin applying pressure to the victim's stomach, either by poking it with a large stick or by putting wooden boards on their stomach and walking on them. 
This method might seem not as bad compared to some of the other ones on this list, but the sheer grossness of this definitely made it that much worse for me. Two, keel hauling. Yarg, keel hauling be a pirate method of fun. Okay, so keel hauling, like my pirate friend explained, was a pirate method of torture that involved the keel of the ship or the bottom. The victim would have their hands or feet tied to a rope, and then they would be thrown overboard, dragged across the bottom of the boat, either from one side to the other, or from the front to the back of the ship. You might be thinking, so just hold your breath and you'll be good, right? No. Keep in mind, the waves out in the ocean are brutal, and the forces underneath the ship are incredible and can bash the victim against the boat so hard that it can kill them. If the blunt trauma and the drowning didn't kill them, Keep in mind that their body would be dragged across the keel, which is the part of the boat that's under the water. And this part of the boat would be covered with sharp and hard barnacles, which would be essentially shredding their entire body as they are dragged across the boat. This method kind of has everything. Water, blunt trauma, sharp objects. It's just brutal and a true torturer's dream. I personally hate water, which is why this is number two for me. One scapism in my opinion this is the worst method of torture on the entire list scapism or being eaten alive historically there are different ways that the scapism method could be used one involving a barrel one involving a boat for this example i will be focusing on the boat method the boat method begins with two boats being nailed together to create a sort of floating coffin. The victim would be secured inside of the boats with their face exposed and their arms and legs hanging outside of the boat. So far it doesn't sound so bad. It just sounds like we're breaking a few rules of Disney. Just wait. Next, the victim would be force fed large amounts of milk and honey, as well as have their exposed limbs covered as well. The milk and honey would attract animals and the excessive force feeding would cause the victim to create large amounts of feces within their own boat coffin, attracting other varmin like rats. The victim would be fed regularly, but would be left to sit helpless and exposed to all the animals and bugs that it would attract, allowing them to eat the victim slowly. Fecal matter would begin to build up and the worms and rats would begin burrowing into your body and eating your extremities. This would truly be a horrible torture method, and for me personally, the worst part is how long this can go on for. Your body can survive in this state while being fed for days, and the longest recorded event of this had the victim living for 17 days, slowly living in their own poop and being eaten alive by bugs, creating infections, and I think dying in probably one of the most gruesome and painful ways imaginable. Like I said in the beginning, this is a personal list. So if you guys disagree, please comment down below which one you believe to be the worst torture method. And if you have some extra time, rank these 10 in your personal order in the comments below. I'm curious to see what you guys think about these torture methods. I'll try to make my next video a bit of a palate cleanse because this video got gross. Trust me, bro. Oh yeah, and this is my first video, so subscribe for more. See ya. In this video, I am going to discuss the scariest mythical creatures or folklore from around the world. I am then going to rank these creatures from creepy, but we could vibe all the way down to please don't exist. Seven, Bigfoot. Okay, so right off the bat, I probably know what you're thinking. What? Bigfoot's not scary. It's not creepy. I wanted to start tame because this video gets dark quick. With Bigfoot being one of the most well-known mythological creatures, I did want to touch on him quickly because I feel like with how well-known he is, there are a lot of elements of his lore that are not talked about. Okay, so for starters, Bigfoot is alleged to be anywhere from 6 to 15 feet tall, muscular, and smelly. With as much evidence that may exist about Bigfoot, there is still a lot that is relatively not known. And for me personally, this unknown makes Bigfoot a rather scary creature. Just imagine yourself up in the mountains, hiking in Oregon. You smell an awful stench that you can't quite describe and you can't quite identify the source of. And you turn around and you see this 15 foot tall muscular ape looking at you. Is your first thought going to be, oh wow, this is cool? Probably not. You're probably going to be terrified, like if you saw any large animal in the wild. With as little as we know about Bigfoot's behavior, it isn't necessarily documented to have had any negative experiences with people, which I guess is good. Personally, I just want to believe that Bigfoot's a chill guy that is just doing his own thing. So that's why I put him as number seven in the creepy but we can vibe category. A little bit of a silly start to this video, but trust me, this video gets dark quick. Six, Night Marchers. Picture yourself on a Hawaiian beach, watching the final moments of a sunset. And as the sun disappears and the darkness sets in, you begin to hear the faint sound of marching and battle drums in the distance. 
That is the Night Marchers. Night Marchers in Hawaiian mythology are the deadly ghosts of ancient tribal Hawaiian warriors. These Night Marchers are the vanguard of the sacred king. On the nights honoring the Hawaiian gods, their spirits are said to rise from their burial sites and march in a large group to ancient Hawaiian battle sites and other sacred places. The legend says that the night marchers are dressed for battle, carrying spears, clubs, and some are even beating war drums and blowing tones from conch shells to announce the advancing of their march. According to the myth, they are suspended in air. Their feet do not touch the ground or leave any evidence of their march. Their march continuously goes on from sunset all the way to sunrise. Apart from just hearing the night marchers, you may also smell a death-like odor or see a distant light of bright torches in the distance. Ancient Hawaiian beliefs state that any mortal looking upon the night marchers will die violently. The night marchers are immune to any sort of barrier and are able to penetrate through any blockade, barrier, or material that may stand in their way. There are two primary ways to guarantee safety during a night marcher raid. One is nepotism, basically meaning having family within the tribe or having ancestors within the tribe that is marching. Or secondly, once you hear the night marcher raid, put your head on the ground as a form of respect and keep your head down until the raid has passed fully and you can no longer hear their marching. To me, the night marchers are a pretty creepy phenomenon and just thinking about it, you see a ghost army slowly appearing from the distance and if you gaze upon them, you will die violently. That's pretty scary, but still not really much compared to what's coming. Five, Lorona. Lorona is a Latin American folklore and a perfect example of why you don't act in anger. Lorona is the spirit of a heartbroken woman who found out her husband was cheating on her and in her rage, she drowned both of her children in the local river. She then came to her senses and realized what she did and drowned herself. But unfortunately, the damage was done. And as a punishment from God, she was sentenced to live in between life and death in this purgatory as a spirit on earth. Lorona's spirit is also known as the weeping woman because she can be heard crying and yelling near bodies of water in the middle of the night. She is said to be looking for the spirits of her children, whom she will not find as they have already passed on to the other side. And because of this, in the middle of the night, she will lure wandering children with gifts as a form of apology, and then will drown them. If you are near a body of water at night and hear a woman crying, your best bet is to leave immediately. It is said that just hearing her weeping causes horrible luck, and listening for too long is asking for death. 4. The Kelpie the Kelpie is a prevalent theme in Celtic folklore and has many accounts from Scotland, Ireland, and Iceland that are all relatively consistent in nature. The Kelpie is described as a beautiful black horse standing in shallow water in a loch. The horse may seem inviting, but if you do encounter a Kelpie, the last thing you want to do is mount it. Almost immediately after contact is made between you and the Kelpie, you will notice that you are bound to the horse almost seemingly glued to the horse's body wherever you touched it. At this point, the Kelpie will slowly begin to walk deeper and deeper into the water, ultimately drowning you and then eating your body. I personally found the Kelpie more scary than Lorona, simply because there is more danger involved. With Lorona, you know there is something creepy going on when you see a screaming ghostly woman. But if you just stumble upon a horse in a lake and it's chill, you're probably going to want to pet it. And at that point, you're already done for. And while Lorona focuses primarily on children, Kelpie doesn't discriminate. If you touch Kelpie, you're done. Three, Mongolian deathworm. So you probably know about the Alaskan bullworm, right? Well, the Mongolian deathworm is a bit worse. The Mongolian deathworm is a creature alleged to exist in the Gobi Desert. In the book On the Trail of Ancient Man, an eyewitness in 1922 described the worm as the following. It is shaped like a sausage, about two or three feet long, has no head nor legs, yet it's so poisonous that merely touching it means instant death. It lives in the most desolate parts of the Gobi Desert. The creature itself is believed to live below the sand and only surfacing to attack its prey, which consists of small rodents, camels, and humans. Besides the creepy nature of a large two, three foot long worm, what's even scarier is its method of killing its prey, which typically consists of either spitting a toxic acid or simply burrowing into the victim's body with its large teeth. Either way, the Mongolian death worm is super scary and not something I'd want to experience. Two, Wendigo. The Wendigo originates from the Algonquin people of Canada and US, and it is a folklore creature that is believed to exist to this day, hidden in extremely remote areas. The Wendigo is often said to be a malevolent spirit that possesses regular innocent humans like you or I. 
Once possessed, the victim becomes overtaken by this insatiable hunger, greed, and desire for human flesh. Wendigos are commonly described as giants that are many times larger than human beings. Whenever a wendigo ate another person, it would grow in proportion to the meal it had just eaten, so it could never be full. Therefore, wendigos are portrayed as simultaneously gluttonous and also extremely thin due to starvation. Although descriptions can somewhat vary, the common denominator between all descriptions of the Wendigo is that it is a malevolent, cannibalistic, supernatural being. An Ojibwe teacher and scholar from Canada gave this description of a Wendigo. The Wendigo was gaunt to the point of emaciation, its desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones, with its bones pushing out against its skin. Its complexion was ash gray of death, and its eyes pushed back deep into their sockets. The Wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton, recently disinherited from its grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody, unclean and suffering from superation of the flesh. The Wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay and composition, of death and corruption. The Wendigo is seen as the embodiment of gluttony, greed, and excess. Never satisfied after killing and consuming a person, they are consistently looking and searching for new victims. I think one of the creepiest attributes besides being huge and terrifying in nature is that they still have the human abilities of the victim that they possessed, meaning that the Wendigo can talk, have mental clarity, maybe not mental clarity, but it can think, and it can taunt and even threaten its victims. The concept and potential existence of the Wendigo to me is terrifying and gets us one step closer to our final entry on the list. One, Skinwalker. If you're a true meme connoisseur, you've probably heard reference of Skinwalkers at one point or another. Now, what I want to do is not only introduce you to the concept of a skinwalker, but also explain why I believe it to be the most terrifying mythical creature ever. A large population of Navajo people firmly believe in skinwalkers, and even go as far as to limit how much they discuss the evil creatures. Skinwalkers are a witch, or shaman of sorts, that murdered someone close to them. They often appear as animals, although typically in a beaten and bloodied state. Although they are commonly described as shapeshifters, it is better to think of them as embodying the skin of their victims. Skinwalkers aren't known to kill without a motive and typically stay to themselves. However, if a skinwalker does have a reason to kill, it starts by isolating its victim. They do this best by calling out to the victim, mimicking a familiar voice to lure you towards them. Yeah. Skinwalkers are known to have limited vocabularies and are believed to only know the last words of their previous victims which is why they are commonly reported to be screaming violently or begging for help. Skinwalkers are not invulnerable and for that reason avoid groups and fights that they believe they cannot win. But just know if you ever scare a deer and you see it run away on its back legs, it probably wasn't a deer. Let me know which creature you guys found to be the scariest. I appreciate you guys watching. We're dropping new videos every single week, so if you're new, feel free to subscribe. And if you ever see a skinwalker, leave it alone. Trust me, bro. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, I hear you. So apparently seven wasn't enough. And apparently we didn't go global enough. And maybe I didn't pronounce something right. So in this video, we are gonna go deep, finding even more, even scarier, even more mythical creatures and folklore from around the world. Part one is linked in the description. Feel free to watch that after this video, you know, Star Wars style. And also the ranking system from video one still applies here. Starting off with cool, but we could vibe and then progressively getting more scary until we reach, please don't exist. Eight, Baba Yaga. Starting off with possibly the chillest vibe in the world of mythical creatures, we have Baba Yaga. And if I'm being completely honest, the only reason Baba Yaga is on this list is because I love saying Baba Yaga, Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga is a character from Slavic folklore and honestly has a bit of interesting and kind of confusing lore. So Baba Yaga is one of three sisters all with the same name and Baba Yaga specifically, not to be confused with Baba Yaga or Baba Yaga, is described in one of two ways. Baba Yaga is described as a repulsive, ferocious looking old woman who fries and eats children and simultaneously is also described as being a nice old woman who helps out those who are lost in the woods and if you're respectful she'll offer you wisdom. Within the context of fairy tales or folklore, Baba Yaga is just as I described either a donor which in fairy tale context means a character that tests the hero and provides magical assistance to the hero upon their success or a villain which doesn't necessarily require any context or could 
appear as both, being slightly ambiguous with their intentions. Baba Yaga is often associated with forest wildlife, and the most distinct traits of Baba Yaga are flying around in a mortar, wielding a pestle, and dwelling deep in the forest in a hut standing on chicken legs. With all this being said, Baba Yaga is definitely creepy, specifically her horrible complexion and her murderous intent on children and her, I guess, cannibalistic tendencies. I definitely believe I could vibe with her good side and just imagine sitting deep in the forest in some weird hut, smoking on some wizard weed. I don't know about you, but sounds kind of cool to me, so that's why Baba Yaga is creepy, but we could vibe. I actually did meet Baba Yaga once and she granted me one wish, so let me show you what I can do now. Look at the subscribe button. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to Trust Me Bro today. Did it work? Let me know. Let's move on. Seven, Chupacabra. Moving to the other side of the world to Puerto Rico and Mexico with a slightly creepier creature, we have the Chupacabra, which literally translates to goat sucker, which is pretty cool. The Chupacabra is definitely one of the most well-known creatures on this list, but I still will give a quick overview of their physical attributes. There are two primary physical descriptions of the Chupacabra. First being very reptilian and alien-like, roughly the size of a small bear with a row of spines going down the back of their neck and reaching the base of their tail. This description is typically from Puerto Rico, whereas the Southwest American and the Mexican description is slightly different. They describe it more as a wolf that has lost its hair and has thin, tattered skin. The creepiness for the Chupacabra definitely depends on which description we're focusing on. For me personally, I find the alien-like four-foot-tall version of the Chupacabra much scarier than the sickly dog-looking Chupacabra. Either way, they're both creepy, and what makes them so feared is the havoc they wreak on livestock. The whole origin story of the Chupacabra is that there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of farm animals that had similar lacerations on their neck and were almost bled dry. These attacks were uncommon from any other sort of animal attack that were common for the time in the area, therefore creating such a phenomenon. For as scary as the Chupacabra may seem, they're only in the number seven spot simply because they target primarily farm animals, which to us really means they're not a threat. Unless you're a farm animal watching this, then I would definitely probably consider putting this as number one. But regardless, we have a lot scarier creatures to cover. So let's keep it moving. Six, Mapingari. The Mapingari is a Brazilian folklore creature said to be the protector of the forest and its animals. The Mapingari is supposedly a former human shaman turned into a hairy humanoid cyclops. Visually, the Mapingari is very similar to Bigfoot with some pretty significant differences, those being having only one large eye having a large mouth in the middle of its stomach, and having backwards feet so it is not as easily tracked. Personally, I think the most terrifying thing about this creature is their physical appearance. Not much is necessarily known about their behavior besides the fact that they have a smell that is so horrid that it is able to render people unconscious, and the fact that their roar is so loud it is deafening to humans. Both of those are very scary as well too, but for me, the Mapingari is most terrifying based on looks alone, which is honestly pretty impressive. Impressive. Like if you were in the woods and smelt something so putrid you felt lightheaded and about to pass out, you turn around and see a one-eyed, tall, hairy creature with a mouth in its stomach and backwards feet, you would probably be terrified. Even if they didn't do anything to you. Even if they just walked away. Even if they handed you a free cupcake, you still would be terrified. I rest my case. Moving on. Five. Corpo Seco. Now, staying in Brazil, we have Corpo Seco which is a dried old skeleton. Corpo Seco is a cursed person, a kind of undead that is condemned to roam the earth forever. It happens when one commits a sin that has no chance of being forgiven. After they die, his spirit is not accepted by God nor the devil. The earth itself rejects that body as if it were disgusted by the sinner. Thus, their dry body, only skin and bones, leaves the place that they were buried to wander during the night. Their only action is to terrify those who see them. Other key elements of their frightening appearance is their long nails and hair, which never stop growing. Although Corpo Seco is only claimed to have the purpose of scaring individuals, it is very well known that the Corpo Seco is evil in nature. Very evil. It is claimed that during his life, he beat his own mother to death for 
no reason, which might explain the whole rejected by God and the devil and the earth. I definitely believe that the Corpo Seco is creepy and scarier than anything else we've seen on this list, but one thing they do lack is a very strong capacity for violence. Some claim that the Corpo Seco has the ability to suck blood from victims to then allow them to look human again for a few days, but this seems a bit far out there, which is hilarious for this list. I definitely believe that this is the perfect spot for Corpo Seco, and I believe we might see another scarier much scarier skeleton half dead zombie down the list for yokai we now have our first asian entry on the list yokai yokai are a class of supernatural entities and spirits in japanese folklore yokai are not demons but they're not angels either they are a spiritual entity and their behavior can range from malevolent to mischievous to even benevolent to humans, depending on how you contact them. For the yokai, their looks vary almost as much as their intentions. They are often described as having animal-like features, such as the kappa, which is depicted as a turtle, or tengu, which is commonly depicted with wings and considered a bird of prey. Although other yokai can appear humanoid in appearance, whereas other yokai resemble inanimate objects, and others resemble no discernible shape at all. Yokai are typically described as having spiritual or supernatural abilities, with shape shifting being one of the most common traits associated with yokai. Could you imagine just like trying to show your friend what a yokai is with examples? Hey bro, check this out. Uh, what is it? Do you see that animal like creature over there? Uh, yeah, it's creepy looking. Yeah. That is a yokai. And even though it looks creepy, it's actually benevolent to humans and is pretty cool. Oh, oh, cool. Hey bro, check this out. Uh, what is it? That is a chair and it's also a yokai. Uh, okay. Yeah, he's very mischievous and will play pranks on you. Okay. Hey bro, check out that cloud of undistinguishable gas in the air. Uh, yeah. That is also a yokai and it's gonna kill you. Oh, great. It's kind of like that SpongeBob scene where it's just like, are you Squidward? You're Squidward? Let me guess, you're Squidward. It's just like, the yokai can either be good, neutral, bad. It can be indistinguishable. It could be humanoid. It could be an object. Like, you're yokai, I'm yokai, we're all yokai. To me personally, the scariest part of the yokai is the fact that they're so indistinguishable and so secretive with their intentions. They could literally be anything, anywhere, with the intention of doing anything. To me, that is just scary. And if I was in a situation where I knew I was to encounter a yokai, I think it would be mental torment, even trying to decipher what is and what isn't a regular object and what is and what isn't trying to hurt me. For me, the yokai's scary factor is definitely within my own personal theoretical factor rather than more of their documented behavior. I just think that their abilities and their intentions are so mixed that with how strong they are combined with how much they can vary, there's a lot of opportunity for scary things to happen. And I think for me, honestly, the scariest part is the unknown in that three nishi i feel like i've been rambling probably more than i should be so i'm going to try to keep it a little bit more concise for the top three here this one like honestly most of the entries on this list was a comment on the last video so if you want part three comment your favorite here but nishi is a bangladeshi folklore and it's honestly quite interesting i feel like the best way to describe nishi is almost like a mix between a skinwalker and yorona in bangladeshi folklore nishi is a ghost or spirit that appears at night the nishi calls out to a victim at night with the voice of someone close to the victim the nishi also takes the form of that voice. However, they keep their distance to make sure that the victim isn't able to fully identify who is calling on them. The Nishi walks very fast and keeps a large distance ahead of the victim and usually leads the way to a deserted area where it can reveal its true form to the helpless victim and then almost certainly kill them. One important thing to note about the Nishi is that they cannot call out more than twice. Thus, the Nishi can be identified if it calls out a person's name no more than two times and only at night. Much about the Nishi is honestly unknown, but one thing I would recommend is if you hear your name called twice at night and you think you see a loved one or a friend off in the distance, don't follow them. The ambiguity and the sheer simplicity of Nishi is terrifying, but we still have two more to go. Two, vampire. Vampires by far are the most well-known and most documented creatures on this list. This was actually going to be number one until I learned about the number one I actually put in place, which we'll get to in a minute. Like I mentioned, vampires are well known, so I wanted to focus on attributes about vampires that are potentially less mainstream. First things first, vampires feed on vital essence. Not just blood, vital essence. Generally in the form of blood, but the vital essence could be any life-bearing fluid from a human being. So 
There's one little idea. Wink, wink. Does that make them scary? No, that honestly makes me feel another way, but I'm not gonna talk about that right now. Anyways, I think the scariest part about vampires are how strong they are. Watch Batman versus Dracula. That's a real animated movie and it's dope. And he almost beats Batman. Obviously Batman wins, but only by the skin of his teeth. Dracula and vampires in general are super strong and almost immortal besides their few pitfalls being sunlight, garlic, and a stake through the heart. In more modern depictions, vampires come across as charismatic and sophisticated, typically being scholarly and well put together. And if you watched our serial killer video, you'll learn that this is the perfect disaster to be swooned by someone who has darker, deeper plans for you. I think my favorite part about vampire lore is how many aspects of it are based in reality and are well documented. For example, during the 18th century, there was a frenzy of vampire sightings in Eastern Europe with frequent stockings and grave diggings to identify and to kill these potential revenants. Even government officials engaged in the hunting and stalking of vampires. Despite being called the Age of Enlightenment, during which most folkloric legends were quelled, the belief in vampires increased dramatically, resulting in a mass hysteria throughout most of Europe. The panic began with an outbreak of alleged vampire attacks in East Prussia in 1721. The first officially reported involves a Serbian man who died and then came back to life to ask his son for food. When his son denied him food, he was found dead the following day. Just imagine, it's the 1700s, you're just chilling. Your dad's been gone for a day, but that's kind of normal. You didn't realize he was dead. You see your dad come up to you, he's looking all weird, dirty, and he's like, hey son, can you get me some 1970s food? And you're like, no, get it yourself. What are you talking about? Get out of here, you messy guy. And then he just gets on you, sucks your blood, and you die. Crazy. But not as crazy as our last and final entry. One. Dragar. Dragar by far is the most powerful, most deadly, most scary mythological creature on this entire list. Dragar is a Scandinavian folklore and is described as the following. Dragar is an undead creature, an animated corpse that inhabits its grave, often guarding burying treasure. The Dragar is a terrifying, zombie-like mythical creature who roams the earth looking for victims. They are infamous resurrected corpses of Viking warriors. These creatures are often described as having a strong stench of rotting flesh and a black and blue skin. Just picture a Viking, but zombified with blue skin, an exposed skeleton. That's basically what they look like. As far as smell, without going into detail, just imagine the worst smell you've ever smelt. Rotting flesh, disgusting, just, just horrible, strong odor. That's just the beginning. The scariest attribute about them is their supernatural strength. Their physical strength is already supernatural and incredibly strong, making them fierce and almost undefeatable warriors to mortals. One of their scariest and potentially strongest supernatural strength is their ability to control the weather, tell the future, and make their way into their victim's dreams. This basically means that if you have any issue at all with one of these creatures, it is a never-ending hell. Even if they're not able to get to you, even if you are consistently running and hiding, you will see them every night in your dreams. They will know where you go as they can predict the future. And if they do find you, their physical strength will overpower you instantly. The sheer aesthetic and the sheer power of these creatures has made them the absolute scariest on this list for me personally, and I really hope they don't exist. I guess what I'm trying to say, and the point of this entire video is, if something smells bad, it's probably a mythical creature. And if somebody smells bad, they're probably a folklore killer. Trust me, bro. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. This was part two. If you want to see part one, the link is in the description. Thank you guys so much for the support and the recommendations in the last video. And with that being said, see you next time. Trust me, bro. Who's that Pokemon? It's Trust me, bro. My, my name's actually Brody. Bro, what are you watching? Oh, dude, I'm just watching the show about people that got killed, tortured, murdered, abused, beaten, mutilated. Uh, why? I don't know, man. It's just so calming and peaceful, honestly. That's concerning. Whether you belong on a list or just have a morbid curiosity in how these twisted people's minds work, this video is for you. One thing to quickly note is that this list is not based off kill count alone. That scary factor is based off of their general vibe, their story, and also their methods. Let's begin. Starting off strong, we have Ted Bundy. This man is literally nightmare fuel. Why was Ted so scary? 
For me personally, it comes down to a few reasons. Primarily being how unassuming he came off. He was literally a wolf in sheep's clothing. He was well-educated, charismatic, charming, although he had a truly twisted and dark side that only came out once you were alone with him. Besides him being almost completely hidden in plain sight, he was also a master of escape and literally escaped police twice. And after the second time he escaped, he committed six more murders, which is literally insane. Something that I find completely ironic is that Ted actually attended law school for a year, which is super random, but I mean, it's not the first time something like that's happened. Once he was finally caught, he eventually admitted to over 30 murders, abducting, assaulting, and murdering young women. And during his trial, he even partially represented himself. And during his sentencing, he literally proposed to his girlfriend. This dude was loving the attention and is a complete lunatic. Next up, we have Harold Shipman, AKA Dr. Death. If you thought that name was bad, trust me, it gets worse. Harold was a family doctor in the small town of Hyde in the United Kingdom. Harold was well known and well respected in his community and a majority of his clients were the elderly. This might seem a little bit random, but this fact is very important. Now let's kind of step back and look at his history. In his early years, he was the primary caretaker for his mother with cancer, and that led him to seeking out medical practice. He became a doctor, had a family, and had a successful practice, although he did end up developing a drug habit that almost cost him his practice. He was fined on multiple drug charges and even went to rehab, but was considered cured by the end of his treatment and was free to practice once again. Once he continued his practice is when things really began to take a turn, specifically elderly women began to die under his care. Shipman would use any reason possible to use a hypodermic needle on his patients, which he would use to deliver them a deadly dose of morphine, causing them to overdose. The interesting thing is this was the same medicine he gave his mother when he was younger. Like Ted Bundy, Shipman is terrifying because of how unassuming he was. Not only was he respected in the community and well-known and a family man, but he was also a family doctor, probably one of the last people that you would assume to be ending people's lives intentionally. Another really scary factor was that his patient base was so vulnerable. And unfortunately, early on, a lot of his victims were just written off because of old age. Shipman was found out because before he killed his last victim, he modified her will to have her leave everything to her family doctor, aka Shipman. Her family was suspicious and they investigated. After a thorough police investigation, it was discovered that Dr. Death was responsible for over 215 deaths. Absolutely terrifying. Third up, we have Andre Chikatilo, AKA the Rostov Ripper or the Butcher of Rostov. He was a serial killer from Soviet Russia. The fact that he was in Soviet Russia actually played a big part in the reason why he was able to go on for so long. The state controlled media was not allowed to talk about serial killings or anything of the sort, specifically because they believed that they did not have that issue. They didn't have serial killers, they thought. They believed that to only be a Western phenomenon. Following the trend, Chikatilo was just an unassuming traveling businessman. Although his urges were much deeper and much darker. And unfortunately, Chikatilo was the type of person known as a necrosatist, someone who gained arousal from pain and violence and murder. Chikatilo targeted runaways, prostitutes, and homeless people as they were considered undesirables or less dead. Over time, the evidence was undeniable and the police were starting to suspect a group was at the loose. And even the general public was starting to believe that there was a werewolf just because of how gruesome the bodies were left. Unfortunately, these investigations were not fruitful simply because they were not looking in the right places. They were literally investigating satanic cults and recent psychiatric ward alumni. It wasn't until they brought in a psychiatrist that they were able to begin making progress and realized that maybe the killer was a normal seeming businessman who could be among us. In an interesting turn of events, Chikatilo was literally caught at a bus stop talking to a potential victim and was found with Vaseline, rope, and a knife in his briefcase. Although once he was brought in, his blood did not match the DNA on the killings and he was only held for a theft he committed. It wasn't until a few years later he was once again brought back in to the police station and at this point they knew they had to get him. Although they didn't have much evidence and time was ticking before they had to release him again, it only took a two hour conversation between Chikatilo and the psychiatrist to have Chikatilo crack and confess to everything. Chikatilo was responsible for the gruesome death of 56 young men and women and was sentenced to death by a bullet in the back of the head. All right, things have gotten pretty dark, but we're just getting started. Let's just take a quick breather together. It's so crazy to think about how twisted these individuals are. Something I wanted to quickly mention is that this video is in no particular order. These individuals do not deserve a ranking and I will not be giving them one. 
All right, buckle up, we're jumping back in. Next up, bringing us back to the US, we have Jeffrey Dahmer. Dahmer is probably one of the most infamous and well-documented serial killers of all time. If you know anything about Jeffrey Dahmer's story, it's not hard to believe why he's on this list. He is one of the most depraved individuals likely to ever exist. From a very young age, he was experiencing intense, violent thoughts, and it didn't take long for him to begin acting on them. From the years of 1978 until his arrest in 1991, Jeff had killed 17 people in uniquely horrific and gruesome ways. Jeff would drug, assault, murder, assault again, chop up, eat, and more to his victims and the bodies of his victims. Not only would he drug, assault, murder, and eat his victims, but he would also mutilate their bodies and keep parts of their body as souvenirs. He even said himself that this made him feel closer to his victims. He says that he didn't want to kill anybody, it was just his only option as he wanted companionship. According to him, his ultimate goal wasn't to murder, he simply wanted a slave who he could control completely and not have to worry about any of their wants or desires. This man was truly, truly twisted. And because there was no death penalty in Wisconsin, he was actually sentenced to 973 years in jail, although he was murdered in jail by a cellmate, thankfully. Following the trend of disgusting, disturbing cannibals, we have Joaquin Kroll, a disturbing serial killer from Germany. Joaquin had an IQ of 76, which is just above the line of being considered mentally challenged. Kroll would primarily find his victims by either going to smaller towns outside of where he lived or simply strolling through and hiding in the forest waiting for victims to pass by. Kroll targeted women and young girls specifically, with his youngest victim being five years old. He would typically start a conversation with a victim and then shortly after strangle them to death and then assault their corpse. He shortly after began cutting chunks of his victim's body off and taking them home to eat. The bodies of his victims were typically found a few days after the incident, although they were never linked to him. And one of the most unfortunate parts of his story is that typically people close to the victim would be considered primary suspects. And there was multiple completely innocent suspects who ended their own lives out of sheer frustration and embarrassment of being considered a suspect. As I'm probably sure you've realized at this point, it's very common that a lot of these people were not necessarily deemed to be serial killers just at a first glance. Even in his own apartment building, Kroll was known as Uncle Kroll to the local children as he would give them treats and allow them to play with dolls in his apartment, which he kept to lure the children. Kroll was eventually caught after he killed a neighborhood child. He tried to dispose of the remains of this child he didn't want in the toilet in the shared bathroom, and as he left the bathroom with the toilet clogged, he told one of his neighbors not to go in there. The toilet was clogged. His neighbor still went to use the bathroom and saw the horrible mess that was in the toilet. He contacted the police, and the police quickly investigated and questioned Kroll directly. They forced their way into his apartment and saw that he was cooking a stew. Kroll quickly admitted to everything and they noticed that the stew literally contained human remains from the victim they were searching for. This man was seriously a monster. Moving over to South America, from Colombia specifically, we have Pedro Lopez, also known as the Monster of the Andes. If you thought it was frustrating and just nonsensical how the police didn't catch any of these people earlier, you're gonna absolutely hate how the story goes. Lopez was literally found guilty of murdering 110 girls in Ecuador alone, but he also confessed to killing an additional 240 women across Peru and Colombia. Now, obviously for having over 300 alleged murders, he is obviously sentenced to death, right? No? Well, he's at least sentenced to life in prison, right? What if I told you that he was literally released on good behavior and now his whereabouts are completely unknown? I'm not making this up, by the way. Pedro Lopez was literally released in 1998 on good behavior and now his whereabouts are not known. I seriously cannot fathom whose idea this was and how they could justify this at all. On top of being somebody who just murdered hundreds of people, something that is extremely scary about this person right now is the fact that they were born in 1948, meaning that right now in 2023, if they're still alive, they're only 75 years old. Meaning that if you just see an old person walking down the side of the road, they might be the monster of the Andes. Insane. This next entry on our very disturbing list brings us back to where we started in the USA. This entry is our third American and final entry. His name is John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy is probably one of the most arranged individuals on this list. And if you've heard of Jeffrey Dahmer, you've probably heard of John Wayne Gacy. Gacy was a businessman and politician and was a liked and respected community figure. Like most people on this list, he was rather unassuming and, unfortunately, 
living a double life. Gacy had a family, a wife, a child, but that didn't stop him from assaulting young men, and although they were silent for some time out of fear for their lives, eventually they came out with their story, and Gacy was charged and imprisoned. Like the previous entry on this list, he was released on good behavior. Absolutely wild. After he was released from prison, he was essentially able to get a fresh start in life and was able to get a job, find a new wife, and start a construction company that was able to be quite lucrative, although it wasn't long until he was at his antics once again. Gacy developed an alter ego named Pogo the Clown, which allowed him to express parts of himself he felt that he had to repress. He appeared at birthday parties, community events, and did magic for children in the hospital. Unfortunately, these displays only brought him closer to his darker self. AC began cruising around at night in his full clown getup and would force young boys to get in his vehicle at gunpoint and then assault them and murder them and bury them in his basement. Gacy was eventually caught because his basement was so full of bodies, his last victim he actually had to ditch in a local river. This body was shortly after found and the police were able to connect the dots and immediately began investigating Gacy. It wasn't long before they got a warrant, searched the basement, and found the bodies. It's interesting because Gacy always denied the accusations and even claimed that the bodies in his basement was a setup to destroy his political career. This man was a complete lunatic. And with that, we conclude my list of the scariest serial killers from around the world. Let me know in the comments the most infamous serial killer from your country if I didn't mention one already. This video is only my fifth video, but was definitely the toughest video I've ever made. Doing research on this video was honestly pretty brutal, and I tried to keep this video as tame as possible for what it was, and if you want detailed, explicit explanations of what happened with these people, there is tons of video out there around that. What I wanted to create was just a simplified version that kind of gave a brief overview of different serial killers from around the world in an interesting way. This video was kind of lacking jokes for obvious reasons, but my next video should be a little bit funnier. And if you enjoyed this video, you would probably enjoy this video about historical torture methods. It's on screen. Feel free to check it out. But that's all for this video. See you next time. Trust me, bro. How would you describe a ninja? Uh, I don't know. Probably black hood, black robes, samurai sword, something like that. Oh yeah, cool, cool. What if I told you you were completely wrong and that was completely stupid? Well, I'd feel like a dumbass. Well, you sure look like one, but don't worry. In this video, I'm going to explain and debunk some very common historical misconceptions. So like I was just explaining to my friend, the way that we commonly imagine ninjas is almost completely inaccurate to the way that they actually looked. Ninjas looked nothing like that, and there was no such thing as a ninja uniform at all. Ninjas typically wore civilian clothing to blend in with everyone else. If you think about it, it makes sense to look like everyone else so they wouldn't draw attention to themselves. Walking around in an all black hooded outfit with a sword on your back would probably cause some suspicion. Even during nighttime operations, ninjas would wear navy blue, not black. One, to hide the stains of blood better. Two, because the navy blue would actually blend into the night sky better than black would. Ninjas were spies, assassins, covert agents, and their ultimate goal and specialty was to hide in plain sight. So the next time a kid comes to your door on Halloween dressed up as a historically inaccurate ninja, make sure you let him know that, hey, you don't look like a ninja, you look like a dummy. And you're not getting any candy, pajama kid. The next misconception is that people only lived to be like 30 in the Middle Ages. That's not true at all. It is an accurate statement to say the life expectancy was shorter in the Middle Ages. However, not nearly as much shorter as you may think. For example, a fully grown, healthy 21-year-old man in medieval times could be expected to live all the way to the age of 64, which isn't necessarily super old, but definitely not, you know, dying in your 30s or 40s. The largest reason for this misconception and common discrepancy is the fact that infant mortality in the Middle Ages was just so high, which is a problem we almost don't have anymore. With modern medicine and technological advances, the infant mortality rate, fortunately, is extremely low nowadays. But in the medieval times, if 50% of people are dying before they hit one year old, obviously the average life expectancy is going to be lower overall. Our third misconception that I personally remember hearing vividly as a child was that if you drop a penny off the Empire State Building and it lands on someone, it will kill them. This is completely false. Without getting too much into detail, let's just go over some simple numbers. For starters, a penny itself only weighs 2.5 grams. With the height that the penny would fall from the Empire State Building, it would have the opportunity to achieve terminal velocity. However, adjusting for wind resistance and air friction would only allow this to really reach anywhere from 30 to 100 miles per hour. Which you might be thinking, 100 miles per hour? Damn, that's gonna kill me. Well, 
No, because you have to think about the energy expenditure once it impacts. It takes roughly 68 joules of power to be able to fracture a human skull. That means anything with a force higher than 68 joules has a high probability of killing you if it impacts with your skull. Now for context, a raindrop with its tiny mass at terminal velocity will only have 0.002 joules of kinetic energy. And a penny at terminal velocity will only have about 0.2 joules. So although you may have heard, and it may seem that a metal object at terminal velocity could easily kill you, that's simply not the case, at least with a penny. So the next time you're up in a high building, throw all the chains you can over the edge. It's completely safe, it's fun, and nobody will get mad at you. And if someone does get mad, just do what that really annoying kid in school would do. Just say, it's a free country. It's a free country. I can do what I want. It's a free country. Nobody thinks that's annoying. It's honestly great. Number four, Benjamin Franklin did not invent or discover electricity. At some point, you probably heard the story of Benjamin Franklin tying a key to a kite and going out in a thunderstorm. Now, this story alone is already debated on when or if it ever even happened, but that's not what I'm focusing on. My focus is on the claim that Benjamin Franklin discovered electricity. Right off the bat, one thing to make very clear is that nobody invented electricity. It seems pretty obvious, but just to clear the air, electricity is a natural force that exists in this world. Therefore, it is not invented, it is simply discovered. A bit of a nitpick, but worth mentioning. Now, to give credit where credit is due, Benjamin Franklin had one of the greatest scientific minds of his time. He was interested in many areas of science, made many discoveries, and even invented many things, including bifocal glasses. But he was not the first to discover electricity. Egyptian scholars wrote in texts in 2750 BC referring to electric fish, known as the thunders of the Nile, and several Mediterranean cultures were aware of static electricity. The first proper electric study was conducted in the 1600s by English scientist William Gilbert, who actually coined the term electricity. Benjamin Franklin had numerous contributions in the field of electricity, notably demonstrating the electric nature of lightning with his key experiment, but he was not the first to discover it. This next one honestly blows my mind. People still believe that WWE is fake when it's obviously real. Like just look at John Cena, he's real. He's as real as it gets. What do you think he's been doing for the last 20 years? Just faking it? Just doing nothing? Why do you think Fred would have John Cena in his movie if he was just a big phony? This is just complete lunacy. And even though it's modern history, it's still history and it's still real. Okay. Have you seen this painting? This is American Gothic by Grant Wood. And if you look at it, what do you see? A man, a woman, a pitchfork, a house, a barn. Now, if you're like most people, you probably assumed, oh, this is a husband and wife. Well, actually, no, this is a daughter and father. So now you just look creepy. Completely off topic, but just kind of interesting was how this painting even came to be in the first place. The only reason this painting exists is because Grant Wood, the original painter of the painting, saw this house that he was so inspired by that he said, I want to paint the people that probably would have lived here. And the people that modeled for the painting aren't even related. The woman in the painting is Grant's sister, and the man is their family dentist, which is so funny, but kind of interesting. Okay, so this next one makes a lot of sense, but I've just never thought about it. Ancient Greek and Roman sculptures were actually originally painted with color. They only appear white today because the original pigments have just deteriorated. There are some well-preserved statues that still have traces of their original color, but it is extremely rare. Think about it. Your 2006 Honda Civic has paint falling off. You think the pigments of 2000 years ago are going to last forever? No. Speaking of things you can't see anymore, Helen Keller was famous for being a great speaker because of her limitations, right? If you do some research on her, or maybe if you just have some peripheral knowledge, that's probably what you understand. But actually, Helen was a great proponent of socialism and communism. She spoke mostly on workers and women's rights, and she advocated for an American communist government. I just find this misconception quite interesting because a lot of information about Helen Keller has nothing to do with this, but this is the primary reason why she gained public popularity. Obviously, her story is motivational, and she was very well-spoken for someone in her situation, but the majority of her initial content was all about communism, which is just so interesting that that's not talked about. Whether you support or don't support communism, I feel like this is just interesting that this fact is just left out. And she's just seen as, oh yeah, she was a great motivational speaker. Well, well what did you talk about? And ladies and gentlemen, the last thing that I want to talk about is not communism. It is our last historical misconception. This misconception is that chastity belts were a medieval thing. Chastity belts were not a medieval thing at all. They didn't even exist back then. Also, a lot of medieval chastity belts that have been found are either complete fakes or anti-masturbation devices from the 19th to 20th century, when there's a widespread belief that masturbation could lead to insanity. In 1878, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, 
Yes, that Kellogg, the creator of cornflakes, he was an advocate for complete abstinence of all kinds. There is literally a quote from John Kellogg that goes as follows. Neither the plague, nor war, nor smallpox, nor similar diseases have produced results so disastrous to humanity as the habit of masturbation. All I'm saying is I think Johnny Boy should stick to cereal. And with that being said, I would love to hear from you guys. How many of these misconceptions have you heard of? And how many of these did you actually believe before watching this video? Let me know in the comments. And also, if there's any misconceptions that you know the truth about, leave them in the comments below. And who knows, maybe I'll make a part two. This is my fourth video and we're dropping brand new videos every single week. So if you enjoy, subscribe. We've got a lot more awesome videos coming up very soon. Trust me, bro. Did you know that Julius Caesar and Cleopatra banged? That's right. Julius Caesar and Cleopatra banged. Sir, this is a Wendy's. Okay, so they obviously don't appreciate cool historical facts at Wendy's, but I know you guys appreciate them. So in this video, I'm going to give you guys a crazy list of historical facts that will make you question history. By this, I mean historical facts that you didn't know happened at the same time. For example, not only did Cleopatra and Julius Caesar live at the same time, they also interacted. Oh, and they interacted all right. It's just crazy to think because most people often associate ancient Egypt and the Roman Empire to be completely different time periods, but they were both such long-lasting civilizations that there was a little overlap. And let me tell you, there was a little overlap. Speaking of overlap, did you know that Martin Luther King Jr. and Anne Frank were born in the same year? I didn't, but even if you did, I think it's still interesting to think about how such powerful timelines happened simultaneously. To me, this is super interesting because both of their stories are well studied and brought up in the context of mid 20th century struggles of justice. Although even though they were born in the same year, at least for myself personally, and I'm assuming others as well too, their stories are associated with completely different time frames when realistically the civil rights movement was only 10 10 years after World War II ended. This is America. Actually, only nine years, which is just crazy. Speaking of crazy, this fact literally blew my mind when I learned it. If you are 52 years old, then you have lived for 1% of all of recorded history. This sounds fake, but let me break it down. Recorded human history only dates back to 5,000 to 5,200 years ago, which means that if you take 1% of all of recorded human history, that's 52 years. If you're 52 years old, or maybe you have a family member or a friend who's 52 years old, let them know that, hey, your life is 1% of all of recorded human history. It's just cool. This is almost more of a math equation than a historical fact, but I thought I'd throw it in because it's definitely a mind bender. Okay, next up, we have one of my favorite facts on this entire list. Did you know that sandwiches are only 14 years older than the United States of America? Yeah, the sandwich as we know it today was invented in 1762 by John Montagu, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. This was just 14 years before the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. Now, you could take this one of two ways. You could either be shocked how old sandwiches are, or you could be shocked how young sandwiches are. Personally, I thought sandwiches were way older. Like, I thought medieval kings were eating on sandwiches on the regular. For how simple sandwiches are, I'm honestly shocked it took this long for them to become a staple item, or even to be invented in their current form. On the other hand though, I totally get why you may be surprised how old sandwiches are, especially that they're so old that they predate the United States of America, simply because sandwiches definitely seem like an American invention. Either way though, I just think it's hilarious that sandwiches are literally older than the United States of America. Also, let me know, did you think that sandwiches were older, like me? Or did you think that sandwiches were more of a recent thing? Now, speaking of things that are way more recent than you probably think, the last execution by guillotine in France was in 1977. This is the same year that Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope was released. Now, if you've seen other videos on this topic, you might have already known this fact. But one small but critical detail that I've seen no one else mention is the fact that Christopher Lee, the actor that played Count Dooku in Star Wars Attack of the Clones, was literally there to witness that last execution. So in case you were ever curious why Willy Wonka's dad, Dr. Wonka, was such a dick in the 2005 Willy Wonka movie, just realized that he saw some shit. Okay, next up, we have a crazy example of the development of technology. Okay, so for starters, there is only a 66-year gap between the Wright brothers' first ever powered flight and the moon landing. A little kind of bonus side point of this is that the first flight actually happened before the introduction of the car. The Wright brothers' first flight was in 1903. In the introduction of the Ford Model T, the car that revolutionized the automotive industry, happened five years later in 1908. Okay, going back to the evolution of aviation, it's so interesting to think about that if there was a little 10-year-old little hater, let's call him little hater junior, if he was there 
10 years old watching the Wright brothers flight and was thinking to himself, they'll never fly. And then same hater little junior old senior now was watching the news in 1969. That 76 year old kid would be losing his mind. Seriously though, imagine in your lifetime if you were able to witness that crazy evolution. It's amazing. You know what else is amazing? Jimi Hendrix on the guitar. He was the groovy, LSD-taken, left-handed playing guitar wizard. And he's still regarded as one of the most influential guitar players of all time. But this video is not on amazing musicians, so why do I bring up Jimi Hendrix? Because he literally died before Pablo Picasso, the Spanish painter. The guy who was born in 1881. To me, it's just so crazy to think that Pablo Picasso was around more recently than Jimi Hendrix. This reminds me a lot of the first example in this video with Martin Luther King Jr. and Anne Frank, where we have two super influential figures who lived simultaneously, but no one ever makes reference of that. And I think in this example, it's even a bit more peculiar, seeing as they're both artists. I do think a large reason for this is because Pablo Picasso literally had 59 years to have a career before Jimi Hendrix was even born, which kind of separates their timelines a bit. But it's still just so interesting to think about that Pablo Picasso lived more recently than Jimi Hendrix. On the topic of living more recently than you might have assumed, did you know that the last living witness of Abraham Lincoln's assassination was literally on live television? Samuel J. Seymour was only a five-year-old boy when he witnessed the assassination of Abraham Lincoln at the Peterson House in Washington, D.C. Samuel appeared on the TV show I've Got a Secret in 1956 where he explains exactly what he saw. I'll link in the description for you to watch after this video that clip of the show because it's really interesting. In this clip, Samuel Seymour was 96 years old and honestly funny as hell and unfortunately he died later that year. I'd highly recommend watching that clip but it's just so interesting to think about that there was somebody who witnessed the death of Abraham Lincoln on television almost a hundred years later. While we're talking about Lincoln, I thought I'd throw in a little bonus. The first selfie ever recorded took place 22 years before Abraham Lincoln's presidency. That selfie was taken in 1839 by Robert Cornelius, and old Abe didn't become president until 1861. I could just imagine President Lincoln being elected, sitting down in the office, and then celebrating by taking a picture of himself and thinking, hmm, maybe I invented this. Maybe I should call this a self-me, a picture of me, myself. Only to be regrettably informed by his staff that that wasn't the first self-me ever. There was actually one that happened 22 years ago and many since, but then his staff informed him that he could be the first to take a picture of something else. Wink, wink. If only they had only fans back then. Anyways, the Golden Gate Bridge was completed in 1937. You know what else happened in 1937? The last Tasmanian tiger died in captivity. Now you might be asking, what is a Tasmanian tiger? And that's exactly the point. It was an extremely rare species of animal that is now extinct. Well, I guess they weren't technically always rare, just more so near the end of their existence. But regardless, the Tasmanian tiger is basically a striped dingo type of thing that was from Australia and the mainland islands of Tasmania and New Guinea. I just thought this was interesting because nowadays we don't necessarily hear about too many animals going extinct that often. So to think that we had such a prevalent species go extinct at the same time that we had such a technological feat be structured, to me at least an interesting juxtaposition. But this is kind of random so I threw this at the end but I thought I'd mention it because I was like, huh, doing this research, the Tasmanian tiger seems pretty dope and I didn't know about it. If you guys know about it, this is probably dope. I didn't know about it, so I, I kind of just wanted an excuse to talk about the Tasmanian tiger, so here's a picture of a Tasmanian tiger. It's a pretty cool looking creature, but for now, that's all from me. Thank you guys so, so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, you would probably love this video on screen right now, Historical Misconceptions. Very similar, but also quite different. Let me know if I missed any interesting historical facts, and if you know any, please leave them in the comments. I love reading them. But until next time, I'll see you guys. Trust me, bro. Peace. In this video, I'm going to give a brief overview of the rise of ancient Rome, and then I'll be focusing in on what I believe to be the three main pillars of ancient Rome's downfall. The Roman Empire. Let me tell you, as a man, this is a topic that is never far from my mind. Although you may think you have an idea of how the Roman Empire either rose or fell, I'm going to assume that there's probably some holes in your knowledge. And today... My goal is to fill those holes, your holes.
Rome, like all good stories, started from humble beginnings. In the very early days, circa 753 BC, Rome was primarily an asylum city and just a stop in the trade route between the Etruscans to the north and the Greeks to the south. What do I mean by asylum city? Rome started as a place where thieves, murderers, runaway slaves, outcasts, and more could have the rare opportunity to become genuine citizens. Rome was a city of refugees and immigrants. This openness, in part, gave Rome the opportunity to become as big as it eventually became. A lot of commonly considered Roman innovation was actually heavily inspired by their northern neighbors, the Etuscans, such as their alphabet, the gladiatorial games, and the political structure. From the beginning in 753 BC to 509 BC, there was seven kings, but in 509 BC, the last king of Rome was expelled for unsavory reasons, and from that point onward, it was decided that no one man should have all that power. The new system that was introduced gave two elected officials one year of power each, instead of a single monarch. Which, if you think about it, is pretty crazy because whose idea was it to let butterflies rule anything anyway? Below the two elected officials was a senate of 300 patricians, which controlled the two elected officials. And below them were the plebs, the masses, essentially People just like the Senate, although they weren't born into the right family and therefore had no say. The plebs were mad about not having any real say in politics and after 200 years of fighting, the Roman Republic was born. The plebs populated most of the army, so when the plebs weren't having their way, they'd threaten to emigrate and fight for other cities. Consistently over time, the Senate would begin submitting to their demands. Hey, uh, if you don't, if you don't give us any, you know, any say in what goes on around here, we're gonna go fight for someone else. What do you want? I'll do anything. In 390 BC, Rome was almost entirely eliminated by a surprise attack. And although they survived the attack, this spooked them enough to trigger a serious military reform. The Roman legions were divided into multiple smaller groups known as manipula, allowing them to be more mobile and more efficient in battle. Over the next 200 years, the new military style was used to consistently expand and conquer. A thousand IQ play used by Rome was instead of ruining the settlements they'd conquer, they would actually impose treaties of alliance with their newly conquered partners, which would allow them to fuel the Roman legions, allowing them to have a seemingly endless army. By 133 BC, there began to be a serious divide within the people of Rome as the wealth gap grew exponentially and the impoverished no longer had anything to lose. The Senate and the Roman people were no longer a unity. Some people did try to suggest offering free bread and public land to the impoverished, but these people were killed by the Senate. Hey, what if we give these people that can't afford to do anything, like a place to live and some food? It was about this time Julius Caesar came about, but for as famous as he was, his chapter in the book of ancient Rome was rather short. During the civil wars, he defeated rival generals and literally banged Cleopatra and gave her the Egyptian throne. Pretty crazy history class crossover episode. After some time with Cleopatra, Caesar returned to Rome, giving himself the title of Imperator, which means victorious commander, and essentially became a dictator. The people saw the writing on the wall and assassinated him rather swiftly. So yeah, there you go. That's the story of Julius Caesar. His rule only lasted four years. After Julius Caesar's assassination, his 19-year-old nephew came to power and ended up ruling for 43 years. He didn't abolish the Republic, but didn't necessarily relinquish total control either. He gave himself the title of first senator, essentially an all-powerful political being. But although he had this power, he was able to not be assassinated. During his rule, times were relatively peaceful. Bread was given to the poor, gladiators were cooler than ever, and the city began to see early signs of modernization. After this peaceful period, there was an era of notably bad emperors that imposed ridiculous laws and did pretty horrible things. But then after that era, there was an era of good emperors, the most notable of which, and the last of which, was Marcus Aurelius, a man who was in power from 161 AD to 180 AD. He spent most of his reign on military expeditions, and in between battles he wrote Meditations, a book that today is still a bestseller and one of the most profound examples of Stoic philosophy. I'd recommend giving it a read. After Marcus Aurelius came his son, and under the rule of his son, began the end of the good times and the beginning of the end began. Not long after, the Roman Empire was split into four states with four leaders, which did not last long as turmoil between the leaders and the states broke out into large-scale war. For a brief period afterwards, Rome was united once more for a final time, and the last emperor of the United Roman Empire ended his reign in 395 AD, and then his son split Rome in two for good, east and west. The eastern half would live on for another thousand years. 
but the western half would suffer and fall victim to the great migration of people, causing divide. So now that you have some context about ancient Rome, what caused it to fall? As you may have gathered, it wasn't just one thing, but more of a combination of things. You may already have some assumptions based off the context I provided, and if you're informed, you may already have your own opinions. But what I'm about to describe are, in my opinion, the top three reasons why Rome ultimately fell. One, corruption and mismanagement. As you've probably noticed, it's not entirely impossible to believe that corruption was pretty common in the Roman Empire, and more specifically, all parts of ancient Rome. Ancient Rome went through multiple iterations of political structures, from monarchies, republics, to eventually empires, not to mention the sheer number of rulers in general. A funny example of blatant mismanagement was Commodus. He was the youngest emperor ever at only 15 years old. He was known to be a reckless, emotional ruler, which was obviously a recipe for disaster. The systems built by those before him made the day-to-day -day operations of the Roman Empire more or less self-sustaining and hard to mess up. However, smaller things were definitely not as much of a challenge. Dude was literally a wannabe dictator slash gladiator. And even though he was known as a reckless, emotional teenager, he was still in power for 15 years until he was eventually assassinated in a bathhouse. 193 CE followed Commodus's rule and became known as the year of the five emperors, which as you can probably assume was because there was five different emperors in one year, one of which was assassinated in only three months and another one literally bought his way into power and was killed three weeks later. The unity and the morale of the Roman Empire was low due to political chaos. The sheer size of the empire and the separation of the settlements made it easy for the different states to begin growing their own cultures and expressing their own autonomy, which eventually led to them breaking away and starting their own empires entirely. The whole mismanagement situation kind of reminds me of a job I had when I was younger. I used to work at a restaurant and the owner of this restaurant kept hiring the weirdest managers. Like me and my coworkers all did great jobs. We all knew how to do our jobs, but every manager that came in was convinced that they knew how to do our job better than us. This happened so frequently that eventually me and my coworkers had no respect for the manager. And we honestly were just not interested in listening to this 45 year old meth enjoyer try to tell us how to do our job. So that didn't last long. We didn't go ahead and start our own restaurant, but we might as well have. Two, religious discourse. The Roman empire traditionally worshiped the pantheon led by Jupiter, which was heavily tied to the Greek pantheon led by Zeus. When Christianity began to gain popularity, the new Abrahamic faith based off of the not so highly favored Judaism was treated rather similarly as a result. The Roman Empire saw new faiths as a threat to the empire as a whole. This religious discourse between the empire and the people and the people and the people was brutal. Larger, bloodier battles have been fought over smaller issues. Just look at modern examples for the destruction that can be caused over religious disagreements. Rome didn't have any external religions gaining popularity within Rome, like Judaism, for example. Rome literally played a key element in the creation of Christianity, which made it an entirely different battle. Now, obviously we know how the story ends, as Greek and Roman polytheistic religions are now referred to as mythology, yet Christianity is one of the most worshipped religions in the world. I feel like this is often more overlooked than it should be, or maybe I'm just looking too far into it, but I definitely feel like the transition of faith was the beginning of the transition out of the Roman Empire. Christianity was eventually mass adopted within the Roman Empire, and the church had massive power, although not everyone was totally on board. I feel like this has less to do with the fall of Rome itself, but at the time when Christianity was initially being introduced, Rome was already in chaos, and I feel like the introduction of this religious discourse on top of political discourse definitely poured more fuel on the fire. 3. Outside Opposition Reasons number one and two are not exclusive to the Roman Empire, and appear in every civilization at some point. Because at the end of the day, all political structures are just groups of people, and people are dumb. My third and final reason falls into this basket as well too, but I believe this reason to be the most major nail in the coffin, as reasons one and two alone would have been able to sustain the Roman Empire for much longer, but reason three could have easily wiped out the Roman Empire by itself, and with the Roman Empire being more vulnerable from the chaos caused by the corruption and religious discourse, I believe that this third reason is the most important factor in Rome's demise. Let's focus in on one group of outside opposition to Rome. The Huns were a nomadic people, consisting of some of the most ruthless warriors of the time. They had been living across Asia and Eastern Europe, and wherever they were, others weren't. They left a trail of terror wherever they went, to put it lightly. 
And although they didn't interact with ancient Rome until later on, they still had a big impact on how Rome fell. The massive Hun conquests caused major influxes of refugees into the Roman Empire. Now, like we originally mentioned, refugees are what helped build Rome originally. But unfortunately, this was not the same Rome and these were not the same refugees. Originally, people came to a growing, thriving Rome as an accepting safe haven. But in this case, the refugees were surviving barbarian warriors fleeing the Huns and they were being thrown into the middle of the chaos of the Roman Empire of the time. It seems obvious to try to incorporate these refugees into the Roman army, right? Well, not to the emperor at the time, as instead of incorporating them into the Roman army, they were exposed for labor or outcasted as they were deemed not a threat. This lack of foresight at scale left a lot of unhappy outsiders inside the empire, causing many parts of the outer regions to be taken by these refugees. Keep in mind, originally when refugees came to the Roman Empire, they were accepted and given citizenship. These refugees were not. They were not accepted and they were not exiled for the most part. They were simply in a purgatory of sorts. After the split of the Roman and Byzantine Empire, this problem only got worse and harder to manage as Rome had limited resources and men to fight. In 476 AD, a barbarian king was the last to invade the Roman Empire as we know it, essentially concluding the fall of the Roman Empire. Although ancient Rome was no longer, to this day, the impact of ancient Rome and the Roman Empire is still very visible, mainly Christianity as a whole, which for the thousand years after the Roman Empire fell, still served primarily as the government across all of Europe. The Roman Empire had so much land to manage, too little funding for their army, too much chaos for sustainability, and too little progress for growth. One thing I do want to quickly mention is that this is more of a bro history lesson than anything else. So if you're looking for something to plagiarize for a school assignment, unless you want to get expelled, I'd suggest watching this just for fun. Trust me, bro. 